Welcome to Control Your Career, a podcast to help you conquer uncertainty, shatter imposter syndrome, and rise above the expectations imposed by others. My name is Julia Toothaker, and I am the career coach and strategist at Ride the Tide Collective, my career development company where I offer career coaching courses, and I have a plethora of free content. I have been doing this work for over a decade, and I want to help empower professionals like you to find clarity, navigate your current career with finesse, and propel yourself toward career advancement in alignment with your unique personality, preferences, and values. This podcast is a great place to start your journey toward controlling your career. Season 10 is all about managers and specifically what managers want and expect from their employees and teams. I've brought on people managers with at least 10 years of experience managing who are also currently managers to help you understand their mindset and expectations. Each episode will have action items that you can apply to your unique situation and consider in your relationship with your manager. You can find this episode and more at ridethetidecollective.com. And you can connect with me on LinkedIn, where I post career information and inspiration to help you control your career. Welcome, everyone. We are back with another episode from the manager's perspective. And my guest today is probably one of my best friends at this point because his wife is one of my best friends. And you know how that goes. We're all connected. He's friends with my husband. It's just one of those situations. But I love that. I love having people on that I know that have like pretty cool jobs. And I think he does. So Mike Ferris is here with us today. And he is the Senior Customer Service Manager at Zep Sales and Service. And I'm sure most of you know Zep, the cleaning product company. I'm sure you have used a lot of their products as I have. I've been, I've been, uh, what is it like influenced by you working at Zep now? <laughs> so we're definitely uh, uh, purchasing their products a little bit more than we used to, I think. But Mike, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to have you as a guest on the podcast. Thank you very much for the invitation. And yes, and I do appreciate you buying Zep products. It keeps me off the streets during the day. Thank you. Yes, yes. All right. (laughs) I want you to do an introduction of yourself because I know that you have such an extensive history, especially within people management. So why don't you let our audience know kind of who you are and where you where you've come from through your career? Sure. Well, I actually started in the bowling industry many, many moons ago and started at the bottom, got into management in their system manager, general manager, and so on. And then I left that because we started a family. So I got into other management jobs and got in with Zep actually 24 years ago. So started at the bottom, moved my way up and, and got into the position where I am now and have managed I countless numbers of, of people in various, various age ranges, uh, you know, various times in their careers, whether it be, you know, something just starting out, they wanted, this is their first job. It was a, just a, I want a job that I can just, you know, take home a check every week and don't want to have a lot of responsibilities. So there's been a variety of, you know, of, of folks that I've managed, you know, all really good people. And, um, you know, everybody was just in a different space at the time. So. But, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So I love this because it sounds like management has been something that kind of gravitated to you and found you from very early in your career, which isn't yeah. that common <laughs> for everybody. A right, lot of right, times yeah. it can take a long time to get to that. So I'm excited to have your perspective here today. So jumping into that, let's mm-hmm. talk about your overall people management style. How would you describe that? And then how has it evolved over the years? I think it's, it's, I try to be hands off when I can. I feel like though, you know, you need to give your, your employees the, the correct training, proper training in the areas they're going to be working in. 
and guidelines, goals, so that they have expectations. So you set those expectations for them to be able to do their job and then you let them do their job. Mm -hmm. So I do, you know, I follow up with them uh, on occasions. You know, we have ways of checking just how they're doing, the things that they're doing each day. So I'll, you know, periodically check in with them. So, you know, things have changed over the years where you were in the office and we're currently not in the office. Mm. So everything now is virtual. So it's been a change. It's it had to change the management style a little bit to sort, you know, to keep up with mm -hmm. just the way things are currently. So it's, it's, if you have to be able to change with those, you know, those, those types of situations. So especially, you know, from COVID and that's really what started it. So. Okay. I, I have a side question and I may or may not cut this out, of the interview, but I feel like I have to ask it because there's a lot of noise right now around companies that are forcing people back into the office and in some cases firing them if they don't return to the office. Zep is one of the companies that has kept people remote or allowed them to transition to remote. I want to know as a manager, have you seen any change in productivity between your team being in the office physically or remote? Not, um, not in my case, because, it, you know, we we're, we're able to track what they do mm -hmm. so we have uh programs that we use that you know that they use on a daily basis that uh that calculates their calls all the times the various mm -hmm. the various things that we you know ask them to do uh we use a couple of different programs for you know create cases for particular issues and you know so we're able to really see what they're doing on a daily basis so you you lose that that one on one mm -hmm. you know factor that you used to have that that a lot of people that some people enjoyed which you know I did so I'm a little bit of a people person but you know I meet with them on a regular basis we have calls on a regular basis because you still have the same issues but it it was just a change in how you you know were able to relate to your to your employees mm -hmm. and so it was, it, you know, and there really hasn't been any expectation for us to go back because I think if we didn't have those, that reporting capability, it might have been a different outcome. So, mm, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate you sharing that because I know that's something that's yeah. been going around. And so to hear yeah. from a people manager who's actually gone through it, I think is helpful for some people to see you know, there are companies that are still working remote and doing it well, and it's okay. <laughs> right. And some, and some of our departments weren't able to do so because they're, they were hands-on. So our warehouse folks, they were in the warehouses and, you know, you're not able to, it's kind of hard to ship when you don't have anybody shipping. So you can't right. really do that from home. So we were, us and several other departments had that, had that capability. And so they found that, you know, again, that we, were able to keep track of their performance and and they were doing they were doing great so we really didn't have an issue and plus i think too some of the employees were happier some missed it again because right. of that the face to face you know interactions but i think a lot of them they're talking pretty regularly just through the phone and and again we do regular meetings with them so they can you know it's on camera mm -hmm, sure, mm -hmm. but you know you at least get to you know keep up with what they're doing and just have some interactions and so on. So, yeah, amazing. Well, let's talk about the hiring process because I know this is something that I've been talking to all my guests about to get an understanding of what you as a people manager is looking for through that process. So, when you are hiring somebody, I'm, I'm going to get into nuts and bolts here. What are you yeah. looking for on a resume and in the interview process from someone? Well, starting with the resume, I you know, based on, you know, what the role is that I'm looking for. So for a while, uh, besides customer service, I also did credit. So credit being accounts receivable. And so depending on what the role was, you know, I'm looking for applicable, applicable experience. So 
you know, did they have this, you know, these certain things on their resume, if it was credit, you know, did they have collection, you know, responsibilities in the past? Mm -hmm. Did they, um, you know, what was sort of their follow-up, you know, how many calls did they make a day and so on? What, you know, what sort of, uh, customer interaction did they have is really what I was looking for on the customer service side. Did they work in a call center or something like a call center? Was it inbound? Was it outbound? Because most of ours are inbound calls. Did they work with a sales team? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, I was looking for people that had, you know, similar experiences to the responsibilities that I knew that they would have. So, and I was pretty flexible on that because, you know, you can adapt, you know, most people to the position if they have, if they have those core values and what they're doing you can teach them the job. Mm -hmm. So is really what it is. And so when I was looking for those folks, I also had to take into account, okay, who do I already have on the team? And I know the personalities, the experience of the employees that I had on the team. So I'm looking for somebody that of course is going to meld with the team that I already have, mm -hmm. you know, so that of course, they get along better they're more productive that's that's really what i looked for and a lot of times you could find that out in the interview mm -hmm. with just how their reactions were to questions how personable they were so in some cases like when i was looking on credit team i was looking for somebody that was a little more assertive because i didn't want somebody that was quiet that was going to go call a customer and say hey i need you to pay us money so <laughs> <laughs> so i needed somebody that had a little go get them attitude and <laughs> I was willing to go out there and say, Hey, you owe us money. So, you know, it was, you know, in customer service, it's a little bit different because you're not out there trying to get money, but you're out there usually resolving issues and in a lot of cases taking orders. And so with their ability to provide that type of service and, and think ahead in some cases like, okay, Hey, we noticed you bought this last time you know, you didn't order it on this order and it's been a few months, you know, and you sometimes get a reaction of, oh, I forgot about that. Thank you. So mm -hmm. looking for folks that would, you know, sort of anticipate what the customer's needs were in addition to dealing with the sales department, we had mm -hmm. commission sales reps. So there was a lot of expectations from them to handle issues quickly. So you needed somebody that could resolve those types of things. And that's really what I was looking for. And sure. You're only going to find out so much information in an interview, but, you know, a lot of times it's your best guess when you have, you know, people that you're, that you're working with and you have, you know, five, 10 different people you're talking to. So. Right, right. I yeah. think this is such a good point in terms of your personality fitting or aligning with the type of work that you're doing. And people don't always do this. I mean, as a career coach, I see people who have been in fields that their personality <laughs> does not really match. And they fight against that every day because they they realize that something is wrong. And when you talked about the credit and you, you know, you're looking for somebody that can really make those phone calls and not get flustered by having to do that. That's such a great example of that. And I want to bring this up because I think for a lot of people, they're in positions because they had to right? They were in a situation where they didn't have a choice to take a job right. or maybe they got pushed into something by somebody else or something like that. But mm -hmm. I think this is a good reminder that if your personality doesn't necessarily fit with the type of work <laughs> that you're doing, you right. might want to reevaluate that and see if there's an area that you can shift into that would be a little bit more natural for you. It doesn't mean you can't do it, it just right. means that it's going to it's going to test you a little bit more and create in some cases a little bit more anxiety probably depending on on what it is so right. i appreciate you bringing that up right yeah <laughs> it's <laughs> and you know and, and it's not that i didn't you know that i had folks that just really weren't right for the position mm -hmm. and you know they knew it and i knew it and it was you know again because you're in an interview and you hope to ask all of the right questions to get the information that you need to make a hiring decision amongst, mm -hmm. you know, two, three, four people sometimes, depending, 
you know, our operation was small. We didn't have a, a 300 person, you know, call center mm -hmm. where most of the time it was, you know, eight, 10, 12 people. And, you know, so you had to, you know, again, take those things into consideration and, you know, you weren't, they weren't just going to like blend into a crowd. They were going to be there in a cubicle with, you know, three other people right next to them and four other people over on the other side of the wall. And you were going to be able to hear those other people in some cases. So, <laughs> so you really needed to find, you know, folks that, you know, weren't used to being on a bullhorn talking at, you know, whatever event. So <laughs> you needed somebody that was, okay, I need you to collect money, but not too loudly. So, <laughs> so you know, and, and so you get a lot of times you could tell that just based on sort of their, your level of interaction when you were doing the interview. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's kind of transition that into choosing the best candidate, because I would imagine, and if I'm wrong, let me know, but ZEP is a well-known organization and customer service can be a pretty popular um, area for a lot of people to go into. So if you have got two candidates <laughs> that have basically the same qualifications and are presenting very similarly, how do you make those hiring decisions? How do you choose the best one in that moment? Well, it, it goes back to, again, the, you know, the responses to the questions, you know, you may have similar, similar backgrounds. So the resumes look very close. They have a lot of the same experience. They have education they have all of those things so i think the interview questions that i was using it basically covered 10 different aspects of the of what they would be doing in a way so it was there was never a yes or no question mm -hmm. it was always something that made them tell me a story made them give me uh at, at more than a one sentence answer and so out of that, a lot of times you can find some little differences that can help you determine, um, you know, which is the right person. And then again, going back to the personality aspect, when they're presenting themselves in an interview too, is what kind of a feeling am I getting talking to this person? So, and, you know, and when you get into the personality piece, you find some differences. Mm -hmm. You know, is this person going to get along with the people that I already have? And you sort of get a feeling from that. And, you know, and it's not always, and it's not always right. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had times where, you know, the person got on the job and they just didn't fit in, you know, so they, or we found other underlying issues that were going on that you, that you, you're not going to discover in an interview. But again, I sort of try to compare their background and look what's best for it and then just see sort of how I feel in an interview. And then I also would have one of either my leads or a supervisor come in and then also mm -hmm. maybe ask some questions just to someone that was closer to the team on the floor to get a better sort of a different aspect of, of the candidate too. What were they feeling about these two? Hey, I've dwindled it down to these two you know, go in there and ask them a couple of questions and, you know, and they knew what the guidelines were, nothing that was, that you weren't supposed to ask, right. but, and me being male, uh, I had many of the workers I have working for effect, the crew that I have now, I have nine ladies working for me in two different States. So I've always had ladies working for me, you know, they've always been just the best and the supervisor was usually female. And so they would come in and they would ask those questions, of course, different perspective, mm -hmm. and then they would mm -hmm. give me their feedback. And so I think if you're not asked, if you're not getting that second perspective for a person mm -hmm. from that's, you know, in a different position, then I don't feel like you're, you're giving them a fair chance. Mm. So, cause then you are just looking at it from your point of view versus giving them an opportunity to shine with say somebody else. Maybe they were intimidated by me because I was a man mm -hmm. and they talk a little bit more about to my female supervisor. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. so I try to look at all of that. 
Yeah, I love that you brought this up because <laughs> this is not something that gets talked about a lot from the interviewing side. And I think, you know, I've I've known a lot of human resources people, and I think that they try to encourage exactly what you're talking about. But sometimes that's not always possible depending on the, the situation or the makeup of the team. Right. But I think what you're talking about is so huge for teams that have the ability to do something like this. So mm -hmm. if it is, and it, I think it goes both ways, right? Male to female, female to male, what, whatever that looks like, because you just never know somebody's situation. You never know their background. You never know what they have been through. You know, I know that I have had supervisors and managers that have looked a certain way. Um, right. And actually in my case, it's been females that I, that I've had the hardest <laughs> time with. I know you're laughing because you know that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little but, bit of insider knowledge on that. A little bit. <laughs> but because of that, I am actually more nervous when I am interviewing with females than I am with males. And so if you think about that in your hiring process, I think this is such a great thing to bring up, especially not only if you have to decide between two candidates, but I think just as a general practice to right. see what somebody else's perspective is going to be. Hey there, Julia here. Is this episode resonating with you? Maybe it's got you questioning how you can better communicate with your manager, team, or just learn more about how to control your career. Well, I've busted into this episode to tell you about my career action coaching. Career coaching is more than job search and resumes. It's also about managing the day-to-day -day situations that come up in your career. This coaching option is perfect for the career management situations that you're dealing with, along with other career-related challenges or goals. This is a flexible coaching option to help tackle specific topics to move forward efficiently and confidently. Not all coaching requires a six month commitment. Career Action Coaching is three hour long sessions that can be customized to your unique needs. Before committing, let's discuss what you need in my complimentary career coaching clarity call. The link will be in the show notes and the description for this episode. Now let's get back to the show. The other thing I wanted to bring up that you mentioned early on was kind of those little nuanced things that come out within an interview, because right. I think sometimes, you know, obviously people get nervous in the interview. And that's one thing. I think if you've interviewed enough people, you understand what nerves looks like and sounds like. Right. But right. some people also show up with almost an air of indifference toward the interview. That doesn't always happen, but I think sometimes you can get a feel in terms of somebody that's like really excited about the position and wants it and is in the way that they speak and how they speak and how they answer questions sounds different <laughs> than somebody that maybe is, I would say, phoning it in a little bit doesn't mean that right. they're not qualified, that they can't do the job, but their right. their level of just drive to want to show up is different. Does that make sense? <laughs> right. No, it no, it does completely and and agreed. So I've interviewed hundreds of candidates. So you can see the different personality types. You can tell when somebody's nervous. And so and I and I I didn't really explain it very much either. So I never interview from behind a desk. Mm. So I in my office and where I was doing the interviews, I put two chairs facing each other. So that way we're on the same level. So mm. my job is to make sure you're the right person for the job that I have available, but I'm not, I don't want to sit behind a desk and show you that I'm superior. Mm. So I don't like that. I want to know the real person that's sitting in front of me not being intimidated by seven feet separation of a desk. Right. So right. I always interview face to face. I leave the door cracked, especially with if I have female candidates and, but I want to know the person. So, and I feel like getting to be able to know that person is making sure that they're comfortable in the interview. Mm -hmm. So, so we'll start out. 
I usually will start out with some those types of questions to try to get them at ease so I can find the real person that's in there behind the nervousness and the the shaking and you know yep, yep. we've <laughs> and, all been and, there <laughs> and, and the, the gripping the armrests and <laughs> you know so and that's really what I'm looking for is because I want to know what that person is going to be like mm-hmm. once they've gotten the position so not you know sitting across from me in a chair hoping to get the position so and sure you know some people have been are just more comfortable in that type of setting and they can handle that type of pressure if you want to call it for lack of a better you know lack of a better word so yeah yeah and i want to point out something too that maybe not everybody understands in terms of power differentials and all of that but what you were describing with the desk so as soon as you put essentially a piece of furniture in between two people, especially if it's an office and a desk situation, but this can happen even at a table. A lot of people will do interviews at like a round table or something like that, or a conference room table. It automatically creates an intimidating power differential between the interviewer and the interviewee. So that's something to think about. This is kind of more on the manager side, but if you're a manager listening to this, that's right. something to think about. But even I think as an employee, you know, what you're talking about is automatically trying to put somebody at ease and all of that. And that right. is, I think, so rare these days that I see that. I think a lot of managers, and I would say this is more inexperienced managers, they're trying to create a power differential of like, right. you need to respect me, which I'm like, respect is earned, but that's fine. That is true. <laughs> That but if true. it starts in the interview where you're trying to intimidate people, like that's right. not going to be helpful for you in the long run because now you're already creating a level of distrust by doing that. So I'm so glad that you brought that up because that's something that I yeah. don't think many people think about. <laughs> yeah. And I think too, as an interviewer, as an interviewee, you know, I hope that it, and I guess maybe from an interviewee's perspective, because it's been a long time since I've that I've had to do an interview. I mean, you know, 24 years at Zap, it's haven't really done too many. So, (laughs) but I think too, it's again, you know, if, if the position is something that, that, you know, you really want to go for, if you, as the interview is the interviewee can sort of ignore, you know, if, if you can kind of ignore that piece of furniture and, you know, keep your, you know, your eyes to eyes and keep that mm-hmm. constant eye contact and sort of take that out of the equation and you know realize that the person behind the desk has a job to do you're in front of the desk and you're trying to get the job that said person behind the desk has it's you know the best thing you can do is you know put your cards out on the table lay out your qualifications education experience mm-hmm. and so on and just present yourself in a positive manner and that's, you know, really to me, what I was looking for was somebody that was, you know, confident in their abilities, had what I need in the past, you know, what they've done with their experience. And, you know, really, but again, my personality is different. I, mm-hmm. I don't like the the power struggle thing. So I would, right. again, rather find out, find somebody who we could just sit back and talk with each other about different things, because that's how I like to deal with my employees you know, is is just have a conversation and, you know, but, you know, of course I like them to know what the expectations are of the job. Here's what you need to do. Here are the goals I need you to obtain, whether it's monthly, it's yearly, whatever. And then here's training. And Mm -hmm. I sit them with somebody for a month. And Mm -hmm. so, but I'm looking for that person that's willing to, you know, to, you know, to do that and be involved in the job and understand that, you know, I need somebody long-term. I'm not looking for a, Mm -hmm. you know, a three month gig. So, right. Okay. I think that segues perfectly into the next question. (laughs) I was reading reading the questions you had. So it's like, wait, how can we work this? (laughs) So let's talk about one-on-ones. You have that person hired, you have your team. What, what do one-on-ones look like? How do you conduct them? What's the expectation there? So similar to similar to the interview process, I don't like to use the desk as a barrier in between us. So a lot of times I had because I had chairs that are, you know, my office was I inherited a big office, so it was mm-hmm. kind of neat. So, 
you know, I would sit in my chair, but I would have the person over here on the side of my desk because just because we need to have a chat about performance or whatever happens to me doesn't mean that I want to alienate them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it's generally in that it's a calm tone. Here's the data. Mm -hmm. Here's what I saw. Here's, you know, email that I got. Here's a phone call that I listened to something like that. And it's really just making sure that the employee understands that this is, this is what's going on. Mm -hmm. So depending on severity of it, you know, it's not acceptable. You know what the policies are of the company. So, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily a policy issue. It's, Hey, you know, when you were talking to so-and-so this particular customer, you know, I would have used different language. Mm -hmm. So maybe something a little more subtle versus look, you know, we're going to shut you off. If you don't give me the $500 that you owe us. Okay. That's yeah, just bring it down a little bit, <laughs> uh, you know, something like that. And so, but it's the same, same thing. They're still a person you've hired them to do a job, but the job has expectations. Right. So I'm not going to dehumanize somebody because they did something wrong, whether policy, whether whatever, because it's, you know, that's just, I don't know. I'm not sure what the right word for it is, but it's just not a nice way to treat someone, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, matter, no matter what position you're in. Right. So, and then it's a matter of, you know, following policy and then you give them what the expectations are to improve. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. then you track it and it's, you follow up with them in whatever that time period is to see how well they're doing. Many cases, you know, they didn't realize what it was or they weren't really pay attention. They were something was going on in their lives that, you know, you try to work around with them and be, you know, be flexible to a point. Some right. were they were just blatant, you know, things that they did that you really had to write them up for. And that is, you know, look, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. The policy says this. Here's what I Here's the, all of the documentation that I have, I'm putting this down and, you know, here you go. Here's the form. I need to see improvement within, you know, three weeks, three months, whatever happens to be. Right. And then you follow up from there. And sure. There's been times in a lot of cases, attendance where you have to let people go because right. they weren't following attendance. It's, right. it's, you know, nothing, you know, against the person personally, but you failed to meet the conditions of the job. Therefore I need to find somebody else to do that. Right. You know, right. And, and it's not, it's not anything extreme. Look, I just need you to be here on time. Right. <laughs> so right. just, just be here on time, turn the phone on when you get here. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And that's, and that's really what it is. So I want to point out something because this is different than I would say the majority of my other guests. And I think that it's because it's customer service. Mm -hmm. And so I want to point this out in terms of the type of work that you're doing and the function that you're doing. The one-on-one -on -one system, the reporting system, the tracking system is going to look different. And so it's what I'm hearing from you is because customer service and this is pretty common for like call centers and things like that, is so heavily tracked that when you're meeting with people regularly, it is really about addressing what has happened, whether that's a positive thing, you know, maybe you excelled in everything, you didn't have any issues like, yay, good job, you know, right. or it's, you know, hey, we got this complaint, you know, what, what you were talking about. So it's going to look a little bit different. And I think that's very interesting because most of my other guests, it's really, you know, conversations about development and all of these other things. It doesn't mean that that doesn't happen here, but right. I think it's important to understand as a professional listening to this, that your one-on-ones are going to look a certain way, depending on what the expectations are of the type of work that you're doing. And so this type of customer right. service work that's right. tracked, or even you were talking about, um, what was it? The collections, right? Like right. The, those are all things that are tracked and kind of performance based in a lot of ways. And so you're going to get that feedback more regularly than somebody in a different type of position. Am I pretty right on with that? Because I know you've managed yeah. it 
in different ways, but yeah, it, and it's and sometimes and sometimes it's you know something was done in the past. And so you're trying to follow up for mm -hmm. on something that, hey, you remember when you talked to this customer a month ago? You know, so it, it's so, yeah. It, and and again, too, it, it's because we do track those types of things. Sometimes things don't show up, you know, mm -hmm. for several weeks. And so you're sort of trying to follow up on that because you don't necessarily know something that happens immediately. Of course, you know, you get an email, you get a phone call from a customer from a sales rep, whatever happens to be, and say, I just got off the phone with this person and that happens. And mm -hmm. so I, I think for the most part, I don't think I've really ever had to call anybody in for that. So uh, it, you know, again, but it is a different type of conversation and, and it really mm -hmm. just depends on what it is again, too, if it's right. a performance based or if it's customer service based, you're, 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 you're going to have different, um, different types of, you know, interactions with customers. And I think too, we're in the past, I had worked for retail. And so you were speaking to, you know, the public and versus, you know, the team now speaks to generally, you know, businesses, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a business to business relationship. You have a, so you have a different interaction when you're not Pete, you know, when you're not dealing with, you know, individuals, people's mm -hmm. money and stuff, you generally have a less, less emotional type of interaction with the customer. So, because it, it's, it's business related and people generally, you know, respect each other on a business to business relationship, unless of course, you know, your person is just, you know, outright abusive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so right. personally, I haven't had that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have, I have another follow-up because, um, I know Zep is now remote, which is, is actually fairly new, you know, since the pandemic has happened. Right. And a lot of the examples you've given have been in that, uh, in the office environment, because that's where you spent the majority of your time. Right. Right. So how does that now translate to the remote space like are you finding that with interviews and one-on-one -on -one conversations are you finding that there's still that that personability that comfortability that you had before or does it look a little bit different now well and to be honest i haven't had to hire anybody since oh. we were out of the office so okay. unfortunately i can't speak to that <laughs> so i've that's also that good. Meet. That means you have good retention. <laughs> Correct. Yes. Yes. I, I, I will say I have a hundred percent retention. So even, and you know, I'll, I'll pat myself on the shoulder a little bit too. Even the folks that I had hired 11 years ago, she still works for me. And so a couple of the other ones that are 10 and 11 years, they got moved to a, the other manager, but they still work for the company. So I feel like I did a pretty good job hiring. So, well, and, and I will tell you too, one of my credit reps that I had hired for 13 years ago or whatever she is now credit manager for north america so yeah she's nice. <laughs> and she's awesome too yeah she's really <laughs> awesome. she is so anyways um <laughs> so yeah see then i went lost track of what i was thinking because i was patting myself on the back so um, the, the interactions right, the interaction. remote now <laughs> right right so yeah, so it's it's different because you, of course, just you know you can't get up from your desk and go down the hall, and that's really what it was. You 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 know you could stand behind your folks, you could go up next to them, you could pull up a chair next to them and talk about things. Um, they would call you, you go down there, and you you know you could sit right next to them and you know resolve whatever issue it was. Mm -hmm. And it may not necessarily have been with a customer; it could have been with a particular issue with the software program, the one that we used. So you now have unfortunately you have messaging that you that i'll get through messaging sometimes it's through email they still call you know on the phone program and call but you sort of lose that human interaction mm -hmm. you know the face-to-face -face interaction that that you lose because just you're not there mm -hmm. so it you know you can still have great conversations and we do, you know, we can still joke and kid and so on and so forth, but it's, it's just a different, it's just a different feeling than when you used to be in the office like that. And you could do, you know, 
Christmas parties, you could do employee, you know, employee things that uh, you got together, you did safety meetings and you kind of made the safety meetings fun. Well, you know, what do you tell an employee now that they're home? Look, just don't trip over your dog while you're at home and working. So, you know, you can answer the phone. So, I mean, so it's, <laughs> so you, you know, you kind of have to come up with different ways of, you know, keeping the team together. And so we do regular calls. Everybody has to be on camera. And so, you know, and they're well aware of an advance. I don't usually just do a pop-up phone call and said, Hey, by the way, uh, <laughs> I probably wouldn't have worn that today, <laughs> you know, so, but so I think though, it's just created a different dynamic mm. that it just, you know, you, you have to change with the times you have to change your management style with the times. Again, I can't walk down the hall and, you know, drag somebody by their ear down the hallway to talk to them. So I have to, you know, do it virtually, you right. know, so it's, <laughs> but, but again, I mean, it, it's, you know, you have that you know, the tracking capability, it, it's, you just lose that him, human interaction, which I like, mm -hmm. um, you know, but, you know, I like the job that I do. So, you know, I, I really appreciate, you know, my employees and what they do. And I will tell them at every meeting, you know, Hey, thanks for everything you do every day, you know, and, and that's because, you know, they need to hear that. Right. And so, and I think when you have that disconnect now with the with being out of the office and being remote, it, it's almost sometimes you need to, I feel like you need to do it a little bit more mm. and to sort of keep that connection, keep that connection there because I don't see them. Right. No, I, I, I don't see them. So, and, uh, it's, you know, and I think I was sort of used to it already because I used to have, uh, I used to deal with folks in Dallas. I used to deal with folks in Canada and I had 20 people under me at a time. So I had supervisors in both locations and I flew up to Canada on regular occasions, but you, I think I was sort of almost already prepared because I did everything virtually back then or over the phone. Right. So it wasn't a hard transition, mm. but it's, it was a transition. So, you know, now with everybody out of the office where I had half in and half out. So, um, but I, th I think that's one of the things you have to consider too, is, you know, are you a people person? So is the job that you're looking for going to be remote? So how is that going to affect your productivity? You know, you want that face to face. You like those being in an office with people. If that's the case, then are you willing to be alone <laughs> in, you know, you know, at a desk in your house, right. You know, so you have to really look at that as, you know, as a job, a prospective job that you would want to take is, you know, mm -hmm. what's the criteria for that job? And is that your personality? So, yes. Oh my gosh. I love all of that. Thank you for providing that perspective. I think that's really helpful for people that are not only trying to decide between in-person and remote, but also understanding how things have shifted right. and what you've had to do and how you support your people. I think that's really helpful for not only, you know, professionals to see, but even other managers to see how Right. How are you conducting yourself as a manager? Are you tell, uh, talking to your people positively? You know, you right. think you are. Maybe, maybe you're not. <laughs> you know, it's like a good little, good little Sometimes temperature question check. Myself. <laughs> okay, wait, was that kind? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you you sort of started to mention this in the one on one uh, conversation, but I want to dive deep into PIPs or performance improvement plans. And it's sounding to me, you know, obviously customer service again, it's it's a much more tracked function. There's a lot more information and data. And so when we talk about building a case, and I hate to put it that way, it was kind of like more of an HR thing, but. When right. we're talking yeah. about, you know, if somebody has done something repeatedly, you have a lot of data where in a lot of other situations, right. it becomes more of like a he said, she said thing in some circumstances. So talk to me right. about PIPs. What does that look like? How, what do you have to do to get on one and can they recover and get off of them? Yeah, I, well, so I think the first thing is, is, 
you need to make sure that, you know, the employee knows what's expected of them. Mm -hmm. So if you never laid out the expectations, they shouldn't get in trouble for something that they didn't know they were supposed to be doing. So the first thing is you need to make sure they understand the expectations of the job. Okay, great. Here's what you're going to do. Now, in addition to that, did you train them properly in said job? So <laughs> if they're missing a piece of something and then you call them in because now they're in trouble for them not doing something they didn't know that they weren't supposed they were supposed to do or not supposed to do, you know, I to me I find that very unfair to the person because I didn't do my job as a manager to either personally train them or have the training person train them. So if you gave them all of those things to be expectations, the goals, the training, you've checked with them to make sure that, yeah, they've been doing this fine for the last three months. We've had no issues whatsoever. And all of a sudden something happened. So now it's, um, and again, being able to track things, it makes it pretty easy. We can listen to calls. We can do things like that. So you can really listen to what, you know, exactly what's going on. And you have a pretty good idea of how their day is going to go. So, you know, with that, and, and it, for me, I, ha I have data that I can use to create said PIP. And, we, you know, we do have one. And it's, you know, it's probably pretty standard. It's a verbal. It's a written. It's a, another written, a final, and so on. And But. I've had situations where, you know, you, they just kind of needed a reminder and mm -hmm. everything turned out fine. And, and it was more of, and it's, and sometimes it was, wow, I didn't realize I was doing that. Right. So I've had some situations where, and probably more along the lines of attendance of, mm. they knew what the policy was. You've brought them in, you've gone through the various steps in the PIP. And for one reason or another, they just couldn't seem to get here on time. So, and it was more of a lifestyle thing, really, is what it ended up being versus really anything else. It's like, look, you're choosing not to leave your house until 10 minutes before you're supposed to be here. <laughs> so you miss three signals, you're late. Right. So leave five minutes earlier or <laughs> leave 20 minutes earlier. You have a break room. So, so sort of, I think to answer your question more of in a roundabout way, it's yes, you can recover from it because in some cases, like I said, they just didn't realize they were doing something incorrect. And three months down the road, when I reevaluate, they were fine. Some folks, unfortunately, can't get here, you know, with the old standard time of eight to five, you know, and that was just difficult for them to do that. And you know, we have a policy that we follow. And so you, you know, it's like, look, I can get somebody else to do the job. I have, you know, every time I go out, I can, you know, find 20 people that want to work mm -hmm. and, you know, and, you know, they're happy. That's what they want to do is customer service. So hopefully I'm answering your question, right? So <laughs> yes, I've had, I've had situations where I've had to let somebody go. I've had situations to where they turned it around, even attendance wise, they've turned it around. So right. I feel like you could always turn it around, but I think what you really have to look at as, as the person is too, is okay, what's really the root cause that I'm doing said, you know, said task, said, you know, thing that got me into trouble. Right. Is it, you know, is it, you know, really something that's like, wow, I didn't really realize that I needed to just get up five minutes earlier and I would be on time. It's something like that. Oh, I didn't really realize what I sounded like on the phone until you play a recording for them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, okay. So, you know, I think, you know, it can go both ways. And it, I think it really ultimately depends on the employee and, you know, looking at that situation. Now, of course, you know, I've heard, you know, times too, where sure, you know, the manager didn't know what they were talking about. They really had no real what do I want to say they really they just really didn't have enough information or didn't ask the right questions mm -hmm. or even have make sure that the employee had enough training and had enough 
were understanding what the expectations were. So in that respect, you know, the employee didn't necessarily do things wrong, but the manager failed to do said training or give those expectations. So as a new employee, it's making sure that you get those expectations. What's expected of me? What are my goals? Um, you know, it, you know, how often are we going to meet, whether it's virtually, whether it's in person, so that we can talk about my performance, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. So I think, you know, if you do that and you're a little bit more assertive as an employee, then, you know, I feel like you're going to have a better relationship with your manager, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I feel like customer service in so many ways because it's so tracked at most companies, it right. actually works in favor of the employee mm -hmm. so much more because, you know, right. you have to go through certain training modules to say the right thing. You have binders of information <laughs> in front of you or, right, right. you know, PDFs and things like that. And then you are being recorded. So yeah. where in certain environments, it really becomes, he said, she said, well, this is what I said to the customer and this is this right. and this is that. And you don't always realize how you sound or how you come across because maybe right. you have something else going on or you're frustrated by something else that happened or whatever. It seems to me like these are situations where you, you really do come with evidence of like, okay, <laughs> here it is, right. you know, but at the same time, I think the approach of did did you get training on this like is this something that maybe we need to you know do another round of training or they need to listen to it or whatever it can be fixed and i think this also supports the idea that a pip should not be a surprise right oh, like right you know if you've been talked to multiple times about the same thing <laughs> and you've been written up at some point you know what that process is going to be. And so people that are surprised by it, and I would say specifically in this, uh, in this function, right? Right. It shouldn't be a surprise if you end up in that situation. Right. Yeah. I mean, and if, and again, too, it, it's, you know, it's a two-way street, you know, between the manager and between the employee. If you're not, if you as the manager are not, and just surprise, you know, hey, just want to let you know, you know, for the last four months, you haven't gotten all the calls you were supposed to be doing. Okay, well, could you have told me that maybe like month one? And, you know, to, you know, hey, you know, what's going on? And I think, too, it's coming from a space of, you know, as my wife says, curiosity. So, I know. So, throw throw that in there. You knew so we were going to make a nod to her at some point. And you knew episode. I was. You knew I was. Yes. So, so I think too, but, you know, so I've learned a lot about that, you know, over the years, not necessarily from that, but I think just being in different situations and scenarios and seeing various employees and sometimes too, going back to what you were saying, mm -hmm. customer service is unique because you can track it and it's more so now than it ever used to be. So with the recording and with you know, all of the various KPIs that they're given and expectations that are given and all the tracking you can do because phone systems are much more automated now. Mm -hmm. And so in the past, you had to go in and, you know, sit next to them mm -hmm. and plug your headset into them, but you're right there. So it's like, okay, well, I know you're listening, so I'm going to be really nice this time. <laughs> so, so I think it's made it, it's made it better, you know, too, but I think with you know, in, in, in regards to other things too, I think, again, it's the manager, but it's the manager's responsibility. And I think one of the things that I learned a long time ago too, was called management by walking around. Mm -hmm. So, and one minute manager, and those were some of the things that I had learned way back when in training. And so, so you learn to get up off from your desk mm -hmm. and go see your people. Right. And so, and going back to, from the employee perspective, if you're not getting that, somebody coming out to see you if you're, you know, in an office or whatever it happens to be, then schedule time with your manager. Just see how you're doing. Just give you an update. And if the manager's doing their job right, they should allow you to have that time. Whether it's five minutes, it's 15 minutes, whatever it happens to be, just, you know, hey, how am I doing? You know, is there anything you need me to work on? And 
I think managers will look at it as a, in a positive way. They should in a positive way, because, you know, you have somebody that is generally interested in doing their job and wants to do a better job. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Okay. I I want to I want to leave it there and kind of do some wrap up now because yep. I feel like we have covered so many things that <laughs> I think are just helpful for people to know and understand and I love even some of the nuggets from the manager side right um especially on the pips you know it's not always on the employee you know it is on the manager as well because they're responsible for their employees performance in some cases right they right. have to give them the information and support them well. So I'm so glad that you brought in that perspective as well, because it really shouldn't all be on the employee. So now, if you could give current employees any advice to be successful in their position and with their manager, what would that be? Um, I think, again, it, it's, you know, I mean, you're, you know, you're really responsible for your own job. So, you know, you own that responsibility to show up every day and do your job as it was given to you, following the guidelines and so on. And I think that, again, you need to be a little more assertive than maybe you're used to in the past and Mm -hmm. really make sure that you are doing the job that the company wants you to do. So that's, that's really what it is. And again, you need to go and find that time. And, and if it's, you know, your manager hasn't talked, well, you know, guy never comes out of his office and, you know, I haven't seen him in like a month and, you know, or that he never calls me or whatever. Well, make the phone call, Mm -hmm. send an email, go down the hallway and say, you know, Hey, could I get 10 minutes of your time? I just want to see how I'm doing. And kind of going back to what I said is it's sometimes that assertiveness that sort of helps you to shine a little more than I hate to say it, the average employee, you know, you know what I mean? So it's to, you know, take, take ownership of your job and make sure that you're doing everything that you can do, especially if you really like the job, if you're just Mm -hmm. showing up for a paycheck, you know, that's different. But if you really like the job you enjoy doing in my case, customer service. And, you know, you like the fact that, Hey, you know, as soon as five o'clock hits, I'm clocking out. I have no responsibilities after that. That's his problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> but if you really truly enjoy the job, it, it's, you know, taking ownership of the position, get that time in with your manager that you can to find out, Hey, what can I do to improve? Hey, what's my next step? If I wanted to advance in the company, what do I need to do? So hopefully the manager sees that as a positive thing and will take 15 minutes out of his day per day to his or her day to talk about those things with you because, you know, that's somebody from my position that it's like, okay, I like that. I can give this person some more responsibility. I can, hey, maybe down the road, I can make this person my lead. Maybe down the road, this person can get advanced to supervisor. Hey, maybe this person's going to take my job one of these days. So, you know, and I think that's, you know, it's, is making sure that you get that interaction and getting that time in there to help, you know, you know, improve yourself. And, you know, if you're really there for the company, help the company to do well too. So. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. Mike, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. I love when like the personal and professional life can collide in a positive way. (laughs) And I think that's what we've done here today. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. You are quite welcome.